Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Adventures Club of Los Angeles. My name is Rich Mayfield, member 1211. Not your program chair anymore. That's Ken Hudson, and he'll be with you next week for the next interview. Today, we are here with Jenna Stacy Dawes. Jenna, thank you for being here with us tonight. Of course. Thanks for having me. This is one of our, uh, I guess this is our second actual virtual interview, so apologize any technical issues that we have as we go through this. Um, but we're excited to be able to do these interviews virtually as well as in person. Um, it, it's, it's a great thing we're doing. So, Jenna, you are a um, wildlife researcher who specializes in giraffes, right? And you work for the San Diego yeah. Zoo, is that correct? Yep, yep, that's correct. All right, so um, how, did you, how did you get involved? Because that's like, you know, as, as a kid, <laughs> lots of kids, that's their dream job, right? Is they want to be a wildlife researcher and, and work for the zoo. Like, that's, that's up there with astronaut and firefighter, you know, and policemen. I think yeah exactly that was that was kind of it for me I still have to pinch myself I don't know how I got lucky enough to do this but um, I was born and raised in San Diego and so working for the zoo or having some involvement with the zoo was always kind of the goal I grew up loving animals and being outside and so when I was um, 12 I actually started with the zoo I they have a volunteer program for teens so I started volunteering and we actually got to travel um, and visit the conservation research center that's up in Escondido, located at the Safari Park, if anyone's ever been to um, okay, the yeah. zoo's kind of second campus. Yeah, so it's it's amazing. And we got to see all of the research being done there. They have this amazing place called the Frozen Zoo, which is where they have a bunch of cells and um, bio data stored from thousands of animals. And I just remember thinking, this is the coolest place ever. I, how do I get to work here one day? Uh, so I went to um, college. I got my degree in zoology from Cal Poly Pomona and started getting involved in the labs on campus and realized um, I actually went in as a pre-vet major thinking, you know, I'll, I'll work with animals. I'll, I'll be an exotic animal vet. But I think it was two weeks in, we had to dehorn a goat and I passed right out and realized <laughs> um, probably wasn't the best field for me. So I got involved in the lab, started doing some field research and kind of realized I was much better suited and, and really loved that being able to be outside but still analyze data. Um, and so after I graduated from there, I found there's the master's program that's actually taught in conjunction at the San Diego Zoo. Um, so I came back and applied for that and started that program. And so was able to get my master's degree through the zoo and work with the researchers at the at the Beckman Center. Um, and then started getting involved on this project. When I graduated, I, I started off as a volunteer and somehow weaseled my way in and convinced them to hire me. And um, so I've been there for about three and a half years now. And yeah, still feel really, really lucky that I get to be able to work for such an awesome organization. Actually, I feel like we're having an impact on the ground. So, um, and work with giraffe. I mean, that's kind of, yeah, that's, every that's constraint awesome. is to work with African animals. So, so um, the Beckman Center, you said it was at the Safari Park. And for those of us who grew up in Southern California, that's, that's what used to be the wild animal park, right? Yes. Yep. That was the wild animal park. So just off the wild animal park kind of off site. Um, there's the vet hospital and then right next door is what we call the Beckman Center, which is where most of the researchers that work at the zoo are based. Um, so there's a lot of labs there. That's where the frozen zoo is. And um, for other people that kind of work mainly in the field like me, there's just some boring old offices. But, <laughs> but I mean, you can walk outside. I imagine you have a pass and you can actually see giraffe because it was the first place I saw giraffes. Like they, you, you go on the tram, right? This, this is mm -hmm. the place you go on the tram and they come right up to you. Yeah. So how, yeah how many you know dra drafts do you guys have there? Do you, do you have them all named and everything? Are they friends with you? You know what? Um, everyone asks me that and it's kind of sad. I don't actually get to see them all that much. Um, I get really lucky though, if we do like talks or, you know, Facebook or Instagram lives um, and I get lucky enough to like go on a caravan, I do get to feed them sometimes and see them. But I actually don't know any of their names um, <laughs> or how many we have. I don't get to see them too much, but they are pretty cool. So, but aside from the, the research you do is not based on the giraffes in the zoo. The, the research you do is based uh, mainly in Africa, correct? 
Yeah, so my uh, main role is working with our field teams that are based in northern Kenya. Um, what's really cool now is the zoo is kind of switching to this one health approach. And so we're trying to figure out ways that we can utilize the animals that we have at the zoo in the safari park to inform our conservation efforts in the field. And so one of the ways we're doing that with giraffe is trying to, I mean, these giraffe, like we were saying with the caravans, you can, they have so many different like um, feedings with, with the public that they're so used to people and that they'll kind of bend down, bring their heads towards you. So we're using that kind of, um, I guess, you know, they're not scared of humans to be able to try new tracking devices. So mm -hmm. we can place some units on these giraffe at the, at the park and the zoo to see how they move. And then hopefully use like those unit designs to place on giraffe in the field instead of having to trial those in the field, which is a lot more dangerous um, and expensive. So yeah, that's kind of one of the ways that we're using giraffe that we have in San Diego, uh, which is really helpful, especially for a year like this when we can't travel. But yeah, my main role is working in Northern Kenya with our field teams that are on the ground. We have a field team called the Twigwa Lindsay, which means giraffe guards in Swahili. And they're all a team of local Kenyans. I think we have, I have to count them now. We have about 20 individuals now that, that make up that team. Um, and they're based pretty much at two conservancies. Um, and they work, you know, on different ecological monitoring as well as community outreach. So they're um, a really incredible, incredible team. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of my main role is is managing the team and, and working with them. Now you mentioned that they're they're called giraffe guards. Um, are, are, are giraffes endangered? I, and I'm not sure what the actual, you know, terminology is like endangered or, or, or uh, at risk or whatever. But what what is the status of giraffe in Africa? Yeah, so unfortunately, um, that's kind of why this program started was because giraffe in 2018 were actually listed as vulnerable to extinction, but different populations of giraffe have different listings. So reticulated giraffe, which is the giraffe that we're working with in Northern Kenya, they are currently listed as endangered. And then there's uh, populations of Northern giraffe, which are actually listed as critically endangered. But kind of as a whole giraffe across Africa are listed as vulnerable. We estimate that there's about 111,000 left, which sounds like a lot, but it's actually really small. It's um, less than the number of elephants. And so when you think of these large megafauna like elephants or rhinos or polar bears, these kind of animals that really draw all the media attention and you hear a lot about their populations and, and we should, we should do everything to protect those animals too. But it's kind of interesting. We've, we've termed this decline of giraffe populations as somewhat of a silent extinction because it's just something that a lot of people aren't aware of. They're not aware that unfortunately giraffe populations are, are really plummeting. They're really affected by, you know, similar things to other animals like habitat loss, land degradation, and uh, poaching. So what, it, what, it, what is the, you know, you mentioned poaching. What's the percentage of these giraffe that exist on a, a, a conservation range versus out in the wild or in the public? So that's, um, so that's kind of goes with a lot of the stuff that we don't know about giraffe. Um, you know, along with this silent ex extinction, one of the problems that we're dealing with as researchers is still this, there's just not a lot of research on giraffe. Not a lot of people have really studied their populations. And so we're kind of starting from scratch when we, really first started the project, a lot of it was just trying to figure out how many giraffe there were. And just in 2019, we worked with a big group across Africa to publish range maps for giraffe. There weren't any updated range maps that kind of showed where giraffe were actually occurring. So that just kind of goes to show how little information there is on them in, in kind of the scientific literature. We still don't really know how big their home ranges are, kind of their, we don't know their social structures. We think it's vision fusion, but it kind of seems to change with each population and, and location. So yeah, there's still a lot we don't know, but in Northern Kenya, we estimate that about 95% of giraffe populations occur outside of formally protected areas like national parks and reserves. Mm. So that means you have a ton of giraffe overlapping with people and wildlife, which is really critical and why we started this kind of community-based program, the Twiggle Lindsay, is to work with communities 
where these giraffe are kind of co-occurring. But um, yeah, that's kind of the, the story for them across Africa is they're not really confined to these reserves and, and national parks. They're found a lot in these community areas. So what is the, um, you know, the, you, you mentioned poaching again, and what, what is the value of a giraffe for a poacher? Yeah, so that kind of varies too, just by location where we're studying them. Um, and I keep bringing up Northern Kenya just because that's um, where uh -huh. I have the most experience. Um, but in Northern Kenya, we've seen mostly it's subsistence hunting. So people are really hunting for meat, for food. A giraffe is a huge animal and that can provide a ton of meat for people. Hmm. Um, whereas in some areas like Tanzania, we've seen it's potentially medicinal usage um, or the giraffe tails has been used in some um, traditional culture. So it just kind of depends on site. Um, but really across the range, we think it's mainly subsistence hunting that's driving poaching. And then secondarily, it's uh, for traditional usage. We're still trying to figure out if a legal trade is a big driver of, of poaching. We don't think it is for giraffe, but um, we're actually working on um, a few papers right now just to try and estimate the, the percentage of giraffe that's, you know, traded across the world we don't we don't totally know yet yeah so it sounds like it sounds like you are doing a lot of the research and and this research is really cutting edge or, or new it which is fascinating to me that the, all the stuff that we don't know so um you know just to put it in perspective because uh, i'm sure you're the right person to ask right you you said oh, we don't so. really <laughs> i would hope so you, you said you, you don't really know what their ranges are so you did mention that you put trackers in the field. So how, how many trackers have been in the field for how long? Like, how, cause, cause you know, at, at some point you have enough and you know, you know, range, but you don't know that yet. So what is the number of trackers that are out there and for how long? Yeah. So we work really closely with, um, on a, it's called a Twiga tracker initiative and it's with draft conservation foundation and Smithsonian conservation biology Institute and Seckenberg Museum in Frankfurt. And that's kind of this large initiative to collar about 250 giraffe across Africa. So um, it's a, you know, a really big project to try and get all of these collars on to really figure out where we're going or where they're going. Um, we know where we're going, I hope. But um, <laughs> in Northern Kenya on reticulated giraffe, this was kind of the first time um, that reticulated giraffe had been tracked. And so in 2017, we attached 11 units to reticulated giraffe. And then in 2019, we attached uh, 28 units. And so we've been able to see really, really cool movements. Um, I was actually just looking at them this morning and my husband probably is so annoyed with me lately, but I'm like, look at how cool this is. You can see I'm kind of really following along rivers. We can see that they're really avoiding. So I talked about that community kind of reserve interface. So one of the study sites we work on is Voisaba Conservancy, and it's a private conservancy. So it's uh, there's no one living inside of it besides the conservancy workers, but it's kind of surrounded on all of its sides by community land. Um, and then to the southern portion, there's another conservancy called Impala Conservancy. And what's really interesting is we can see the draft kind of staying to these conservancy lands, so really avoiding the community areas which, um, you know, is great for that area because you have those conservancy lands. But if we can figure out how to, you know, better allow giraffe and people to coexist, um, because that's how we're going to save them. We can't put giraffe into reserves and conservancies across Africa. There's just not enough space. Mm -hmm. um, so it's we're really trying to figure out how we can better allow for humans and livestock and wildlife to, to coexist. And so that's one of the ways these these trackers are really helping, but um, that was just kind of what we found from um, the collars in Northern Kenya, but they, we've put collars on in Uganda, in Namibia, in Niger, in um, South Africa, they just deployed some, and it really is kind of led by this larger Twiga tracker initiative, um, which is really cool to be a part of. Now, before, before this current initiative, was there any tracker data on gir giraffe? There were some. So, um, you know, it's a little bit interesting, too. If you think about a giraffe's physiology 
And we think about a regular kind of radio collar that you would put on a lion or a mountain lion. Um, you can't really do that with giraffes. They have really long necks. And so if you put on a regular collar, uh, which they tried, when they bend down to drink or um, the males fight with their necks. And so when they did that, they would bust the collars off or the collars would slide up and down hmm. and just be really annoying to a giraffe. Um, when you put on these units, you want to make sure they're, you know, as least interference with the animal as possible. You don't want to cause any disturbance. And so they've gone through a lot of iterations of what's the best design. So um, they tried some harnesses that kind of went over like a saddle. Um, you know, those were absolutely massive. They were expensive to make and then just really big on the animal. And then the second or the third iteration was kind of a headband where they kind of put the headband around a giraffe and it had the, the satellite unit at the top. Um, mm -hmm. These worked for some giraffe, but some species of giraffe actually have a third or what we call it a, a medial ossicone. Um, and so it would cut into the ossicone. It just wasn't wasn't efficient. It was, um, you know, as the giraffe grew, it it just became a little bit too detrimental. And so now we're actually using what we call Aussie units. And so they actually bolt right into the ossicone of a giraffe. And so they're really small. They're about the size of a matchbox, um, uh -huh. and they're satellite powered. So they send a signal to a satellite every hour. So I can actually go online and view the data on Google Earth from here in San Diego. Um, and they're, yeah, they last for about two years and that's kind of where we're at now. So um, that's kind of the evolution of, of giraffe tracking units, but also why it's taken so long to try and get really valuable data because they just are kind of weird animals that have um, caused some problems. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can, I can see how it would be Difficult. So, Andy, could we pull up a picture? Is the proper word a herd of giraffe? Yeah. So the the scientific word is a herd, um, but you'll also hear them called a tower, which is my favorite. I like to call them a tower. So um, this tower so. of giraffe, I could. We do we have that up? So you can see um, what what did you call it? the uh, not the horns? The ossicone. The ossicone. So mm -hmm. the the new trackers actually have to go be bolted in it's almost like a tag right so i can yeah. i can see how like you know technology didn't exist where we could have a matchbox size thing so is that the deal exactly we, we've kind of gotten to the point with technology where we can have a satellite tracker that's small enough to bolt to their head yeah yeah so these have been developed um with a company that's actually based in kenya called satellite tracking or savannah tracking sorry um and they've been amazing to work with and help us kind of design these units. So that really is, you know, with Giraffe Conservation Foundation and Smithsonian as part of this larger Twiga tracker has been to try and figure out new unit designs. And so um, another really cool thing about these units is they're solar powered. And so they have a tiny little solar panel on them. And because Kenya gets a ton of sun, um, it helps us recharge and keep the battery going for longer. So sometimes when you see those really big elephant collars, um, they have a really big unit on them because the battery lasts for so long. But trying to make the unit smaller for draft, we were worried about battery size, but the solar power um, or solar panel allows us to kind of lose a little bit of battery um, so that we can make it smaller. So yeah, the technology is amazing. And um, yeah, it's it's really cool to, to kind of see it being developed. So what what does it cost to track a single giraffe? Like, because I imagine this is your field, right? So beginning to the end, you got to buy the tracker and then you got to get it on giraffe and then you, you, you have to pay for the data plan to upload all that satellite data, right? So like, what, mm -hmm. are, all, what are all those pieces cost to actually track, track a giraffe? And what's the hardest part? Yeah, so it's actually um, very expensive and um, which is why, you know, we do a lot of fundraising to try and get money to do this because it's, so at one unit is about $2,500. Okay. And then we do have to pay for the, so like a year of data downloads or two years, depending on how long we think the unit will work. Um, but the most expensive part is really the kind of field operation and immobilization of a giraffe. So I kind of mentioned before how weird a giraffe's physiology is. Well, it's even, you know, more complex when you think about bringing them down to the ground and kind of laying them on their side, which is what you really have to do to put a unit on them. And if you think about a draft, you know, it's 
really, really rare to see them lying down just because it's so hard for them to get down to the ground in the first place. But to have them lay on their side is even more rare. And they have um, an insane amount of blood pressure because their heart is so large and has to pump their blood so high up into their hmm. neck to their brain that if you have them in the laying down position for too long, it can actually cause them to have an aneurysm. And so huh. it's a really complex, yeah, <laughs> they just make everything difficult on us. Um, so that's kind of why, you know, I talked about earlier about trialing some units on giraffe at the park that are willing to just kind of bend down for you because it is risky to immobilize a giraffe in the field. And so when you're thinking about that, you're thinking about, you know, all the vets. So we work really closely with in-country vets. So in Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service. And so you have to pay for the immobilization drugs, the vet time, you know, all the cars. And then, um, you know, in some of the areas we work, you can't access it by vehicle. It's so dense. It's so mountainous that we have to use helicopters, which are so expensive per hour. Um, and so it can be really expensive just to do a single giraffe. And so, um, yeah, it's not it's not that cheap, but um, I'd say on average, you know, to call her about five giraffe, you're, you're spending, you know, close to $50,000, $100,000 um, huh. just with all of the units, all of the mobilization drugs, all of the vet time and helicopter time. So yeah, it's, it's quite expensive, but the data you get is so valuable that it is worth it. So you've been out a couple times on this. I think you sent us a picture um, <laughs> you, uh, of, of a giraffe on its side. And now, now it's hitting me like how rare that is. You're standing there with a the giraffe's head in your hands on the ground. That's pretty rare, right? Can we, can we pull that up? Do you have that picture, Andy? He'll, he'll pull it up. But um, so I want to hear about that operation because, I mean, it, you, you had to had, had a great time doing that, right? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I talk about the dream job. I always said, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to get into field conservation was because I really wanted to call her an animal. And I didn't ever think that I would be calling a giraffe. Um, but that was something it's so I've been lucky enough to be part of two um, coloring operations. So I got to be a part of one in Uganda um, that Giraffe Conservation Foundation was leading. And then in Northern Kenya, where San Diego Zoo was tagging those reticulated giraffes in partnership with Smithsonian and Giraffe Conservation Foundation. So it's, you know, another weird thing about giraffe physiology. So I'll kind of explain the whole procedure because it's it's really, really fascinating, and um, it's an adrenaline rush. <laughs> I want to start before so you found a giraffe, right? So, like, you know, like going out there, finding, selecting, like, walk us through, like, that adventure. Yeah. So, um, I was involved in the vehicle-based operations because with the helicopter ones, you there's only, like, a certain amount of space in um, in the helicopter, so you have to have the vet, you have to have someone that's trained. Um, you usually want two vets just, just in case. Um, and then you want someone that's trained in restraining a giraffe and you can't see it because I'm sitting down, but I'm only like five foot one. And so um, I don't have total manpower to bring down a giraffe by myself. Does it matter um, at so that you, point, like a, a five foot one person or six foot one? I mean, you're working with a giraffe. I feel like your, your, your height is <laughs> inconsequential within that foot it range. It actually does. Um, so these giraffe are so um, interesting once you um, try and get them down to the ground. So um, you use a drug that is safe for giraffe, but it has a weird reaction with them. So unlike a lot of animals where you'll hit them with the immobilization drug and they'll kind of walk around and then fall to the ground, giraffe will walk around for a second and all of a sudden you'll see them kind of start to stumble and then they just take off running. Um, mm. It's a really weird reaction that happens. And so what happens is you just follow the giraffe and you try and follow it until it starts to do this thing where it kind of high steps and you can tell it's getting a little bit woozier. And so you jump out of the car and you have a group of about four or five people that all have a rope and it looks like a crazy rodeo. Um, you then try and get the rope around the giraffe and kind of cross its legs so that it falls like gracefully to the ground. And the reason you do that instead of just letting it fall is because if it falls in a weird way, if it falls face first, it could hurt its neck. If it falls backwards, it could, you know, crack its skull. And so by allowing it to kind of guiding it to the ground with this rope, you're 
kind of providing the best opportunity to have for it to have a safe fall because again it's it's falling from 15 feet up 16 feet up depending on how big the giraffe is um so yeah that's why i say um it does actually matter how big you are because they are even then when you have the rope on you're running with the thing trying to get it to to kind of um stop running so it's it is, it's really, really exciting. Um, it's a little bit different than other collarings where you just kind of dart it, wait for it to fall and then walk in. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm gonna have to watch a video of this now. I'm just thinking of like <laughs> Star Wars, right? You know, them taking down those big AT, AT walkers and like try to do yeah. it gracefully. So is anybody actually trying to catch its head or something like that? Or you just basically have to let this thing's head hit the ground? Yeah, so usually when you have the ropes, um, it kind of allows it, and the draft is still somewhat awake at this point because it hasn't fallen on its own. So the way it kind of falls, it still has its neck up. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, because of their blood pressure is so high, you don't want them in that laying down position for very long. And so we actually, as soon as the draft is on the ground, you have the vet right there giving it the reversal. So then you have about everyone. I'm not sure if some of those pictures, you can kind of see people laying on top of the giraffe. Yeah. That's because the giraffe is fully awake when it's on the ground because we give it the reversal as soon as it's laying down. So you've basically, now, the, the drug just basically puts it down at which point mm -hmm. you're immobilizing it. Yeah. And, it, and yeah. It's, so you it's have people back just up. laying on top of it. We're all kind of avoiding the legs because it's awake so it can still kick. So they still <laughs> have really strong legs. And so you just... And you could have about four people on the neck and that would be enough because they use their neck to kind of get up. They use that motion. Um, so yeah, so then you have about, we try and get them up within 10 minutes. Um, so you take all the samples we can. Um, and then, yeah, you kind of all just slowly get off and giraffe kind of looks around and gets up. And um, a lot of times they, they don't run away. They'll kind of get up and walk away and look back at you like, what just happened? What? <laughs> yeah. Well, what I mean, you know, th they gave you the job taking its temperature, right? Yeah, yeah, I did send you that picture. <laughs> so I imagine that the the giraffe might give you Do you have that picture, Andy? You put that one up. That uh <laughs> that that's the dirty look that the giraffe's giving you, right? Thanks for that. Yes, yeah. That was probably one of the, uh, that's probably one of the coolest things I've ever done, um, taking the temperature of a giraffe. But we're also, you know, it's really, really hot in the field. Uh -huh. That was in Uganda. And so we're monitoring the giraffe to make sure that it's not overheating and uh, pouring buckets of water on it to make sure that it's staying cool. So huh. um, yeah, it's a it's a really intense procedure, but the data we get and the, the maps we're able to create have been really helpful and kind of allowing us to figure out, you know, what we can do to, to better protect them, where they're going. Um, and like I said, we just don't have a lot of historical knowledge. So it's really helpful for us moving forward. So, so you mentioned earlier that you weren't quite sure whether a tower of giraffes, what kind of social structure it had going on. Can you kind of explain what, what have you, have you found anything out based on the tracking of whether or not those, those groups are, uh, what were the two terms that you used to describe the social structure? So we usually uh, refer to it as fission fusion, which um, is kind of, you know, unlike um, elephants or other really social animals like wolves, where they stay together. What we see with giraffes, and we've kind of seen it mainly through um, just monitoring our, our Twiggle Lindsay team that I was talking about. So our field team in Kenya will go out and just monitor these herds of giraffe is that you'll have groups of individuals that stay together for a few days and then they go off. And then you'll have other groups just come together. And then all of a sudden you'll have our, our team has seen 90 giraffes together. And so you'll have like 90 giraffes together one day and then all of a sudden you'll have groups of 10 or 20 or three or two. There's kind of no, they don't have like a, a certain social structure that we have that we know of so far it doesn't seem like you know maternal side stays together or cousins stay together it just kind of seems like random aggregations of individuals but that's something we're still trying to figure out um and it's also really hard to tell unless you monitor giraffe from like when they were born up until when they're adult to tell if they're related 
Um, so one of the really cool things that our team in Kenya is doing and something that we've worked on with a lot of partners is a database called Giraffe Spotter. And this is a really, really cool database that uses an advanced coat recognition technology to identify individual giraffes. So each giraffe has a unique coat pattern. So just like our fingerprints, we can use those coat patterns to identify individuals. And what our team does is they'll go out in the field and take a picture of the right side of every giraffe they encounter. We can upload it into this database. It runs it through this algorithm and tells us, yeah, you've seen that giraffe before. No, this is a new individual and it kind of creates like a Facebook profile page for it mm -hmm. and gives it a name um, or yeah, you've seen it last week. And then it also puts together these like social bubbles of who you saw it with. So we can kind of start to understand, oh, we saw A42 with B42 last week, but then we haven't seen them together since. That's super um, so, cool. Yeah. So it's facial recognition <laughs> technology, but it does it on their coat. So um, how, are, how are you getting all these pictures into the database? Are you, are you collecting like the, the, the GPS, the geolocation data, as well as like tie all that kind of stuff? How, how are you getting it in? Yeah, so when our team is in the field, they'll go out anytime they come across a giraffe, they'll stop and record kind of the herd size. So how many giraffe are in the herd? And then for every giraffe they can, they'll take that picture, record the coordinates of that individual. Then they record the distance and the bearing. So kind of how far away is the individual and what is the angle to you? And we can use that to kind of um, later in GIS or kind of like a computer programming sister, system, I can go in and kind of project the points to where the giraffe actually was. And then they also record the sex, um, the estimated age, and then any weird notes about the individual. And then um, whenever I go to Kenya, I collect all this data that's on a hard drive. And I come back and I, um, it's one of the things I do um, once I'm back in the office is go through all the data. And we have a, an uploader form for Giraffe Sparta that we used to, to upload that data onto the database. Then it kind of runs through it and um, tells so us who those individuals are. You're literally flying a hard drive back from Kenya. So they're, yeah. they're equipped with a computer and a camera and everything. And because I'm thinking, you know, with the cell phone, I'm not sure, I'm not, I, I know a lot of nations have kind of skipped over telephones and gone right to cell phones, right? And with mm -hmm. the cell phone, you get all that instantly, right? But not quite there yet. Yeah. So we are kind of. Um, so our team uses iPads in the field um, and they all have cell phones. Um, I WhatsApp them constantly, which is really nice to, to stay in contact with them. Um, but they have a really cool app on these iPads. It's called Survey123, where they can input all of the data. And then as soon as they're connected to Wi-Fi, they can sync it so I can see the data right away. The hard part is getting the images because they're so uh. big, it's really hard to send them over the networks. And in Northern Kenya, the the Wi-Fi and the cell service is very, very lacking. And our teams, um, especially our team in the Namanyo Conservancy, it's so remote. We have um, a router that we bought, brought for them, but they use solar panels to charge all of their devices. And so they have to connect to this router and sometimes they'll have to climb to the top of the hill to get it to connect. And so hmm. sending data is still um, a little bit challenging for us. Um, especially, so we also have motion activated cameras that are in the field, camera traps, um, and those collect a ton of data. So trying to send that data over without using hard drives has been uh, really challenging. But um, then I also get to go to Kenya a few times a year to, to train well, that's the team cool. and, and collect the data. <laughs> but that's interesting. It's not, it's not connectivity that's necessarily the issue because you said you used WhatsApp to, to mm -hmm. contact them all the time and stay in touch but it's the bandwidth and you yeah. know we we don't even think about images here in the united states you know sending an image back and forth i mean it happens as fast as you can scroll through your feed on instagram right like an, another image pop, pops up but you know that is a lot of data yeah exactly i mean these um i mean specifically for our camera traps we collected close to two million images just last year alone um huh. which is incredible data for us and also a ton of data to, to go through on the back end. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's such a massive amount of data that it's really hard to, 
send it any other way. Um, and then for our photo monitoring data, they go out about three or four times a, a week. And since we have two teams doing this, you know, we can get up to 100, 200 photos a week. So um, over time, yeah, it really adds up. <laughs> I'd say, that's great. So yeah. <laughs> um, when was the first time you went to Africa? Like when did you, cause I mean this again, dream job, right? And, and I'm sure, did you, did you get to go as a volunteer or were you on staff by the time they're like, all right, now we're going to send you to Africa? So I was actually on staff, on staff the first time I got to go to Kenya. My first trip to Africa was actually to Namibia. Um, with the master's degree I was doing, I got to go work with Cheetah Conservation Fund for a few weeks. Um, oh, cool. So they're located in Namibia. Yeah, that was kind of my first experience. Um, and... I just, you know, always kind of the, the childhood dream of anyone that wants to work with animals is always the dream to get to go to Africa. Um, so yeah, that was that was my first experience. And then my first trip to Kenya was in November, 2017. Um, and so I, I got to go and meet the team on the ground. And um, gosh, I've been back. It's sad, but I don't remember how many times I've been back. I think it's been about six or seven times since. Quite a few times though. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and always, so, so you took a trip and you, you collared some giraffe on a couple occasions, right? And picking up data mm -hmm. and working with teams on the ground. This is like the real deal stuff, huh? <laughs> yeah, so um, the collaring operations were really exciting to be a part of, but my main role is really working with the Twiggle Lindsay team on the ground. So um, when I'm going over to Kenya, I mainly you know, we have the teams at two study sites. So I'm usually bouncing between the two sites and, and kind of training them on new ecological monitoring methods. So we'll do new camera trap protocols or I'll train them on how to do that photo monitoring. Um, something really cool that we've been doing lately is what we call rapid assessments, where we'll go to different conservancies and kind of do these really quick photo monitoring. So you'll drive the entire conservancy and take pictures of all the giraffe you can find. And we can upload them onto that giraffe spotter database and kind of get an idea of how many giraffe that conservancy has and if those giraffe are moving to another conservancy that we've surveyed. So yeah, my main role when I go over there is really working with the teams. And then because we have so many partners on the ground like Northern Rangelands Trust or Giraffe Conservation Foundation, I'll go. Um, and it's not as fun, but have meetings with our partners and, um, you know, talk about all the boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the stuff that, the, the boring stuff is what, uh, is how you learn, right? That's the yeah. important stuff at the end of the day. <laughs> so I was going to ask you what the coolest thing you've ever seen there, but I, I'm going to ask you instead, how many, what, what is the largest tower of giraffe that you've seen out there where was there a moment where you ever like wow this is just amazing yeah so I should have sent the video over um but it was in August of I think it was 2018 um and it was a really dry summer and so you know when you have limited water you'll we'll see more or larger towers of giraffe kind of congregate in a certain area and we call this um one area the Sarara Valley it's within Namanyuk Conservancy, and it's really this kind of safe haven where the communities and um, local NGOs have worked really hard to protect the wildlife. And so giraffe kind of congregate in this area. They know it's a safe spot. And we were driving out to um, do like a, a camera trap training or something, and there was a massive herd running of about 50 or 60 giraffe. And I, even when I look at the video still, you... I mean, it's mm. just in incredible. I can't really explain how amazing it is to see that many giraffe in in one setting. Um, and our and team how far has away were pictures. you? We were, um, oh gosh, in a car, not that far away. Um, I don't know how, maybe 500 feet. I mean, not like enough to get your heart far. beating. Like, wow, because 50 or 60, that's yeah. a lot of that's a lot of animals moving. Yes. Yeah. Giraffe, uh, when you see them in the wild, they're absolutely incredible. They're so graceful and um, just peaceful when you see them. And like, you know, if I was, uh, I've been closer to elephants and that's a little bit more heart pounding, like, okay, uh, <laughs> we can go, we can back up now. Um, but there's something about giraffe that when you're, you know, a lot of the times when we're out in the field, we just turn off the car and 
um, are collecting that data. And it's just so quiet and peaceful when you're around them. They're just, they're awesome. I'm so, biased though, but. <laughs> so for, for those people watching, I, I, I guess for the, for the kids that want to do this when they, when they grow up, what do you, what do you, what kind of advice do you have for them? Like, how do you get into this? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, years of volunteering. I, um, you know, I, as I said, I started off volunteering with the zoo and just trying to get my name out there and then just trying different things to see what I liked. Um, I knew I wanted to work with animals, but, you know, as I said, I was a pre-vet. I thought, you know, that was the way you worked with animals and uh, found out really quickly that that wasn't going to be my path. And so, you know, I started working with, um, an invertebrate lab at Cal Poly Pomona. So I studied honeybees uh, hmm. for a while, which was really cool when I got to be outside collecting data. But um, compared to, you know, mammals and, and big megafauna, honeybees were kind of not, not totally my thing. Um, and I also started working in a um, lab studying lizards, which was really cool again, too. But um, it just kind of all pushed me towards, I was like, okay, I know I want to do field research, but what exactly do I want to do with that? And I knew I wanted to, I always said I wanted to make a difference. I wanted to do something that actually had an impact. Um, and so my first kind of field experience was I actually went to Costa Rica and studied howler monkey behavior for a while while I was in college. And um, so I went down there for about six weeks and just spent some time in the jungle really saying if I wanted to kind of study animals and found out that I absolutely loved it. So um, yeah, I just kind of tried everything and volunteered where I could. And, you know, that's how I ended up getting this job was volunteering and just saying like, hey, I think you guys may need help on this project. Ken, is there anything I can do? And just, you know, putting in the time and, and getting your name out there. So volunteer, volunteer and and go to school, obviously. You got a master's degree in this mm -hmm. stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. So I did get my master's degree and then, um, you know, it's a lot of school. Um, I'm currently um, almost done with a, another master's degree because I figured why not torture myself again. Um, but there's just so much, you know, so much that we can learn and do. And um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of school, a lot of learning, but it's all, I mean, if you enjoy it, like I, I think I'm a nerd, but I think some of the school is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of impact have you guys already made with this and what what do you kind of hope to see in the future like what what's your what's your big stretch goal for for the future of the draft population in Africa yeah so i mean overall we'd love to you know see the draft population in africa increase and become steady um you know working with draft conservation foundation they have a ton of different programs in africa and they've done an amazing job kind of working with local governments to get national strategies in place to really make draft conservation a priority. And in Northern Kenya with the Twiggle Lindsay, when we first started, we estimated that there was about 30% of the population or the communities that we are working with that were consuming giraffe meat or parts. And, you know, for an animal that's not doing too well, that's a big kind of high number. And so, you know, it's been about five years now. We started the program in 2016 and we just did surveys last year that indicate um, those numbers are way, way down. And so I think that's kind of shown us where we can have the biggest impact is really using our teams on the ground to work with local communities to become the champions of giraffe. As I kind of mentioned, because they're co-occurring in these community landscapes, really working with the communities that live alongside them is I think how we're going to be able to, to save them into the future, as well as, you know, trying to figure out where they're going, what they're doing, and using those scientific measures to develop really targeted and defined conservation strategies. So I hope we're having a difference on the ground. Um, the team is, is absolutely incredible, and to see their passion for conservation really, um, you know, every time I go over there, I feel like this is why I do this job, is to see how motivated they are to save the animals that they work with. So that's cool. Yeah. So, so um, you know, we've been doing this live. 
followers on our YouTube channel probably have a lot of questions in the chat. So what I'd like to do <laughs> is I'd like to field a couple questions from, from our live viewers here. So Andy, Absolutely. who you haven't met, but if you, if you were here in person, <laughs> and we, we do hope you'll come in person uh, when we open back up at some point. I yeah, think a lot of people to. would like to meet and talk to you. Um, but Andy, the question from the chat. For sure. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, our first question tonight comes from Veronica Anderson. And Veronica says, Stacy, or Jenna Stacy Dawes, when you put the sensors on the giraffes, are you also able to draw blood for genetic information? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah. So because, you know, it's so um, hard to get a giraffe on the ground, we try and, you know, make use of that. So um, usually when they're on the ground, you're, we're collecting a ton of data. So we do a lot of measurements. So measuring their legs, measuring their head. Uh, we also take a few tail hairs that we can use for DNA testing and genetic analysis. Um, and then there is a vet doing blood draws. And one of the things that's, you know, we kind of mentioned how little we know about giraffe. One of the things that I think that I haven't touched on yet that I think is so crazy is that up until about three years ago, we thought giraffe were a single species, but we found out through genetic analysis and a lot of these blood draws that we're able to do when a giraffe is on the ground that giraffe were actually made up of four distinct species. So it'd huh. be as different as like a grizzly bear and a polar bear. So reticulated giraffe are as different from a Maasai giraffe as a grizzly bear and a polar bear, which, you know, we had no idea before. Um, and for, for lay so, people yeah. out there, what, what defines the difference in a species? Like how do you as a scientist <laughs> or a researcher define, define a different species? So that's a really heated debate, um, and it kind of varies with who you ask. I kind of um, rely basically on the most updated science. And so with these giraffe species, um, with the argument for the four giraffe species, it used a ton of genetic testing and genomic analysis to really look at how different they were. Um, and so it's way above my knowledge of how to actually do that analysis. Um, but that's kind of, you know, when, you know, in history books or in biology books, it's, you kind of learn that a species is two animals that, you know, they can't reproduce. Um, there's different definitions, but now we're kind of seeing that that may not be the case just with how advanced kind of genetic testing has become. Yeah, because that's a difficult thing, especially with a wild, wild giraffe. Like, how are you going to determine if they can reproduce? And produce because I've also heard it, it say re reproduce a viable offspring, so offspring mm -hmm. that can go on to reproduce, right? Yeah. So how do you how do you how do you test that with a limited number <laughs> of species or limited number of giraffe in the wild? Yeah, and that's definitely something. So in zoos, a lot of um, zoo-based giraffe are actually a mix. So they're reticulated, what we call reticulated Rothschild's giraffe, um, and they can produce viable offspring. And we think in the wild too. So if you look, Kenya is really a, you know, kind of hotbed of giraffe conservation because it's the only country that has three different types of giraffes. So you have the Maasai, reticulated and Northern giraffe. And if you look at the ranges, historically they overlapped or occurred within close proximity. So who's to say they didn't hybridize or didn't mate? Um, so when we actually do a lot of our immobilizations and that's one of the things that uh, Giraffe Conservation Foundation is really looking at right now is, are there hybrids in the field? When we were on Loisaba, which is kind of middle, um, I guess Midwestern Northern Kenya, which is a little bit hard to explain, um, but there's some giraffe that do not look like a typical reticulated giraffe should. And so one of the things that we're doing when they are immobilized is taking those blood samples to see, you know, could it be a mix of uh, Rothschild's giraffe and a reticulated giraffe, um, but that's kind of all still being done. But um, so yeah. I can see how this would be a heated debate because if there are hybrid <laughs> giraffe in the wild, is that another species? Yeah. So, but what you're saying is that the the, the new scientific uh, trend. Uh, <laughs> do you say scientific trend, or is that kind of something that you know you you want to shy away from? But the, but the new the 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 most up to date thinking will say. Is that that you do species analysis with with genetics? 
that's what they're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, and that's what's kind of showing us those those four distinct species is just that really intense genetic testing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's still, so IUCN um, still looks at one giraffe species. There's a lot you still have to go through to prove that, you know, it's not just, okay, let's do this one genetic thing. It looks like there's four species and that's what we're going to go with. So um, there's still a lot that kind of needs to go into it to kind of further make those conclusions. Um, but just, yeah, looking at the most up-to-date science, it does appear that there are four distinct species of giraffe, but there's, yeah, a lot of a lot of politics and a lot that goes into making sure that's correct. So I'm, <laughs> I am interested in this. I want to dig a little deeper. So like what, in terms of like the difference in the DNA between these four species, how does that line up, say, between like, um, you know, a Great Dane uh, and a dog, right? A Great Dane versus a pug. Like, what's the separation between those two versus, do you have any sort of, like, comparative? You know, I wish I knew. Um, I don't. That's kind of out of out of my realm. Um, but I do, like, the easiest way for us to describe it is kind of like the grizzly bear, polar bear thing is, yeah. you know, when you think about those two animals, you kind of know like, okay, those are two distinct species, but they're both bears. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of another animal that we could use to kind well, like of, like maybe like a wolf elephant, and a dog. African elephant. Yeah. They're both elephants, but they're distinct species. With giraffe, it's just a little bit harder to tell because a lot of them look really similar. They don't kind of have any really distinct, um, you know, sometimes their coat patterns are are distinct, but they don't have any different like morphological characteristics that really define them. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. Next question, <laughs> please. Next question comes from David Hayen. Thank you, David. Uh, Jenna, where does the temperature probe go? I think we all know. <laughs> did you show that picture? picture? You put that picture up, right? <laughs> yeah, I sure did. And it it's goes up where again. you think it goes. That's yes. why the giraffe why gave her a weird look as he animal. walked away. He woke up and he shook and looked, looked back at her. And <laughs> All right, next question. Next question comes from uh, Larry Stern. How many scientists worldwide are studying giraffes? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know the exact number. Um, you know, not as many as there are like elephant researchers, but there's quite a big group. And we... Um, and one of the things that's really cool about giraffe conservation is that it's a really collaborative group. So, um, you know, I've, I've mentioned Giraffe Conservation Foundation and Smithsonian quite a few times, but it's because we're all working so closely together to try and figure out what's going on with giraffe. And we all kind of have unique expertise and different things that we can contribute while not overlapping and making sure that, you know, we're kind of all spreading out our resources to have the biggest impact, which I think is is really cool. And it's really, you know, I think important to see kind of that trend moving forward for conservation is not having these like, you know, one-off research projects, but to have everyone really working together for that common goal. Um, so I'm not sure the exact number of giraffe researchers, but I work really closely with about 15 or so um, that are from Smithsonian Giraffe Conservation Foundation, Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, um, Laowa Wildlife Conservancy, and different places all over the world. Yeah. So maybe maybe worldwide, definitely less than a hundred. Yes, I would say so. <laughs> but it's a pretty tight tight community. Yeah, yeah. It's really um, it's really awesome to be able. We have what we call a giraffe science symposium every few years, and so we'll. Um, bring all of the researchers together to try and outline priorities as well as, you know, who's going to work on what and who can partner with what, which I think is a really way, cool way to do things. You know, we can, Smithsonian has access to this, so we can use that. Our Giraffe Conservation Foundation has, you know, expertise here, so let's use them there. You know, it's, um, you know, I think a, a more collaborative environment that really, like I said, you know, allows us to have more impact on the ground. Super cool. All right. Next question, Andy. Next question comes from David Hayen again. Uh, which country has the most giraffes and which country has the least, I'm assuming, of countries that are supposed to have giraffes? Yeah. So I believe ooh, you might have to, to 
to correct me on this one. I will look it up if I'm wrong, though, because I will look this up afterwards to make sure. Um, but I believe Niger has the least Niger Chad. Okay. Um, yeah, these are some of the populations of northern giraffe that are really critically endangered. And then um, one thing that's really interesting is we see South African giraffe are the population that's increasing the most. Um, so in South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, where we have southern giraffe, those giraffe populations are doing quite well. Um, so all the other giraffe, Maasai, northern reticulated, are all um, stable or decreasing, but southern giraffe that are, um, yeah, found in Angola, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, their populations are are increasing and doing the best. What's what's the thought on what's driving that? Um, you know, it's it's a interesting debate. Um, I don't work too closely with those populations, so I'm not sure. Um, one of the you know interesting debates, though, is those are all the countries where hunting is legal, um, but you also have more private game reserves there where you have more people kind of um, invested in keeping wildlife. So it's a it's a little bit different um, how I guess the the land is divided. And so that's one thought that could be contributing to it. But yeah, we're still kind of trying to assess that situation and, and why a lot of the South African giraffe too that are or sorry, Southern giraffe that are in South Africa are extra limital. So what that means is they've been brought in. So this wasn't their historic range, but they now occur. You know, you would have never seen giraffe um, along the tip of, of Africa or like in the very Southern part of South Africa but they brought them there for those game ranches and game farms. So now you have um, more population there. So, so now we talked about Northern, Northern giraffe and Southern giraffe. Is there, is there like a band of no giraffe in the middle, you know, of, of like equatorial Africa or what's the deal? Yeah. So if you kind of think about where those big jungles are, where you'd have like gorillas and Okapi and those really thick, like DRC and the Congo, uh, no giraffe there. So they're really kind of more savanna plains animals. So they kind of, um, if you're thinking about Africa, they're kind of, um, they kind of span like right under the desert, the Sahara Desert, kind of around to Eastern Africa, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and then down um, kind of avoiding those like really tropical jungly areas. I have the advantage of a huge map right behind me. So it's, it, it's, it's been very useful. <laughs> I know I was kind of trying to look at the one behind me, but Africa. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have a few more questions in the chat. I think we, lots of, lots of questions. In the a couple chat more tonight, questions. From let's, let's take at least three or four more. For sure. Uh, next question comes from Larry Stern. Who funds your foundation? And I think the so, follow-up to that is, is how can more people fund your foundation? <laughs> that is a wonderful question. I love that question. Um, so we are mainly funded by private donors. We apply for a lot of grants. Um, so we're grant and donor funded. And then um, I'm really lucky and my colleague um, that I work really closely with at the zoo is really lucky and that we are supported by um, zoo sales. Um, which is amazing when the zoo is open. Unfortunately, you know, this year has, has been really hard for the zoo. Um, and so it's been a challenge, but yeah, we are mainly donor funded. So if you want any more information about the project, you can go to San Diego Zoo Global um, and look up giraffes and that'll have kind of a whole page on what the project is and how you can support it and um, just more information on and, you know, where we are, how many giraffes there are, what we're doing, and then giraffes at the park, too. There's really cool um, giraffe cams that you can watch just the giraffes roam around the safari park, which That's is cool. a nice activity. <laughs> and we'll put, we'll put those links in the description of this video. All right, next question, please. Next question comes from Veronica Anderson. How has the worldwide pandemic affected your ability or inability to travel to Africa to collect data, train, etc.? Has it put your research on hold for a short time? Yeah, so um, I haven't been able to travel since um, last March. I was um, actually in Kenya and I left for Kenya March 1st of last year um, and then got kind of stuck in Uganda for a while when, um, you know, a lot of the travel bans and, and the pandemic became yeah. an actual pandemic, um, which was a little... Um, 
interesting. It was uh, a little frightening, I'm not going to lie. I love Africa. I love Uganda. But spending a year there was a little terrifying, um, <laughs> knowing that my animals and my horse were at home. Um, but I haven't been able to travel back since. Um, Kenya is allowing people in, but, you know, the zoo is just being really cautious and, you know, it's just not a good time to travel right now. Um, Kenya doesn't have the same medical structure we do. So we've been really cautious about potentially going and, you know, bringing something um, that they couldn't really combat. But, um, you know, we've been really lucky and that our teams have been um, in place for since 2016. And most of our team members have been with the project since then. Um, so they've had a ton of experience and because we only get to travel about three times a year, we're able to stay connected through WhatsApp. Um, I Zoomed this morning with our conservation coordinator. And so we're able to stay in contact that way. It has been very challenging in terms of, you know, problem solving or additional trainings. Um, as I mentioned, the connectivity is really challenging sometimes. And so getting our data um, so are you shipping are you shipping hard drives like in FedEx or DHL? We are not. So uh, how much data do you have waiting <laughs> for you? Like is there like terabytes worth of data waiting in Africa that needs to get picked up? And how much is it? Yes. Yeah, so we sent um, a big crate of supplies. So that's another thing that's really um, challenging is getting supplies to our team. So when I travel to Kenya, I usually travel with about three huge cargo bags of stuff like camera traps and batteries and tents, um, lights, so our shoes, hiking boots for the team. A lot of the stuff is really hard to um, find in Kenya or it's just really expensive. It's a lot cheaper here. So it's cheaper for us to pay for the baggage fees and bring it with us. Mm. Um, but uh, we shipped some supplies over and they're still stuck in customs. They've been stuck in customs for about three months. So we're a little bit scared to ship our data back in case uh, that happens. And these are all the hard copies. Um, huh. You can't really see it, but um, I have just a big um, crate of about 20 hard drives from previous trips that um, are with me in my home office here. Can you I, hold that up I for us? To... I think that'd be interesting. Or is it is it too heavy mm -hmm. to lift up? <laughs> I will. I will grab it. It is a lot of hard drives. These are all of our our. Oh wow! Hard drives of data. <laughs> um, and then so it says fire cool. evac box. So if there's ever a fire in your house, you're grabbing that box, and it has all your data in it. Is that the idea? Yeah. So that was actually that's from our office. Um. So when I'm at the office at the zoo, that's in our office, and if. There's a fire near the zoo, that box gets grabbed first. <laughs> As kind of like an engineer and a tech guy, I really want to introduce you to like cloud storage. <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to. So they are stored on the cloud too. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Thank yes, God. Yeah. All right, next are, question, please. Um, yes, they are backed up. We have a huge, huge um, data array at um, the zoo that they're all backed up there and then they're backed up on the cloud. But this is. Uh, That's good. We have. Um, a really cool citizen science site where it's called wildwatchkenya.org and all of our data from the camera traps is actually put onto that site. Um, I mentioned there's like we captured two million images last year and so it's you know our research team is about two people here at the zoo uh -huh. and so by using the citizen science site we can go through the data so much faster because basically all of our pictures go on the site and anyone from all over the world can go on and help us like figure out what's in those images. Um, so that's why I have all the hard drives because I work on uploading the images to the site. But yeah, if any of you want to get involved in the project, um, you can just go to wildwatchkenya.org and kind of help us. You can take a virtual safari to, to Northern Kenya. Is it kind of like doing images. one of those capture things? It's like click on all the images that have giraffes in them. Yes, <laughs> you have to click yeah, on pretty it. much. <laughs> that's cool. All right, next question, please. Next. Next question comes from Michael Lawler. Michael says, did you know that giraffes and humans have the same number of neck vertebra? Do you have any other amazing giraffe trivia for us? Oh, that's a good one. Yes, that is one of my favorite ones to use um, because it's, it's when you look at their neck, you there's no possible way they have the same. Um, but another one I'm trying to think that's really cool. Um, 
Well, their tongue is purple um, because they feed on acacia and because the sun is so bright in Africa. So when they're feeding on acacia, their tongue is constantly out in the sun. Huh. So it's purple to kind of prevent their tongue from getting sunburned. That's interesting. What yeah. What's their blood pressure, by the way? You mentioned that it was super high. Do you know what that number I, is? I should. I do not know the exact number. Like, but yeah, it, like if a human had that blood pressure, they would they would not be in good shape. No, yeah, no. But yeah, if you just think about, I mean, there's some fact, this would be a good trivia for me to actually remember at some point, but um, about how much blood their heart can actually pump at one time. Um, but I, yeah, I can't remember. It's but a that's lot, a good huh? one to look up if any of you have a question. <laughs> All right, one more question, Andy. Final question from the chat comes from KL Hudson Business Consulting. How tall is an average giraffe and weight? So I don't know the average weight, but we estimate that most are, you know, 15 to 16 feet tall. Um, I believe the tallest giraffe currently is actually a giraffe at um, Australia Zoo. He is about like 18 feet tall. He's massive, um, but that's, he's the biggest one. He's the world record holder. Um, so at yeah, but feet. yeah, most. At 18 Sorry, feet. I missed that. 18 feet, you said was the tallest. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they average about 15 to 16. Um, there's actually a really, really cool article. Um, I don't know, it, it just made a lot of news last week. Um, that two dwarf giraffes were actually formally identified um, by Giraffe Conservation Foundation. So one in Namibia and one in Uganda. And that's kind of a fun story to look up. Um, they're really weird looking. They look um, like miniature giraffes. But they're, they're like proportionate though. They're, they're proportionate? No, so their legs are really small. Oh, okay. So it's like a yeah, tiny so pony giraffe. bodies look normal. Huh, that's yeah. interesting. They look, I think they're adorable. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a fun story to look up. That was actually just published um, just a few weeks ago. All right. Well, hey, Jenna, thank you for coming by. Well, well, thank you for joining us, I guess is the appropriate term for Zoom. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us here at the club and uh, I invite you to come by when we actually open, open back up. Thank you, everybody, for watching. It's, it's been a great and informative presentation. Um, I'm definitely going to take my kid down to the, to the uh, safari park. I keep saying wild animal <laughs> park in my head. Safari park is the proper branding because we want to go see some giraffes now.